Okay, so I don't know if you've seen this, but last Thursday, the 12th of May, the newspapers announced that for the first time, plants were grown in the moon dust, uh, which had been brought home um, by Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and other astronauts from three Apollo missions, 11, 12, and 17. NASA had given um, a few precious teaspoons of lunar soil, only 12 grams, to the University of Florida's Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences. So their team's success in showing that plants will grow in lunar soil is a significant step in the ongoing project of establishing our colonies of the, on the moon. Uh, the lunar base that NASA is currently developing will, will rely on 3D printed infrastructure, which will include landing pads, habitats, and roads. As the only celestial body, with surface features visible to the naked eye, uh, the moon was the first other world in the ancient Western civilization. When it was not constructed in mythical cosmogonic terms, the moon was presented as an actual physical place. Interestingly, in these early periods, the moon was imagined as another earth, not so much different to the ways in which the Florida scientists see its potential today, 2,600 years later. In one of his uh, rhapsodies from remote antiquity, the Thracian bard Orpheus writes that the moon has many mountains, many cities, many mansions. The claim that the moon was of an earthly nature was later expressed by Thales, uh, 6th century, sorry, something is... Okay. Uh, was expressed by Thales, a 6th century pre-Socratic philosopher, uh, of the Malaysian school. And this idea was solidified by Anaxagoras in the fifth century, uh, who touched upon the moon's uh, habitable features, saying that men were formed on other planets and the other creatures which have life. The men too have inhabited cities and cultivated fields as with us. They have also a sun and a moon and the rest as with us and their earth produces for them many things of various kinds the best of which they gather together into dw their dwellings and live upon. Anaxagoras was of course followed by his pupil Democritus, who spoke of other worlds and other Democrituses. And then a little later, Philolaeus of Croton um, proposed that the moon is inhabited like our own, with living creatures and plants that are bigger and more beautiful than ours. Indeed, the animals on it are 15 times as powerful and do not excrete, and the day is correspondingly long. So for Philolaeus, as you can see, the moon is a kind of a superior, more pristine earth, a place where animals do not soil themselves. And his contemporary, Herodotus of Heraclea, referred to the lunar humankind, stating that the women there lie eggs, uh, from which men 15 times our size hatch. When many centuries later, Galileo aimed his telescope at the night sky in 1609, he enabled for the first time the empirical investigation of the moon as a possible geography, uh, not just of the moon, but also of other planets. Uh, in Sidereus Nuncius, Galileo corroborated these ancient philosophical theories, okay, not the one about men 15 times the size, uh, but he did state that our satellite does not possess a smooth and polished surface, but one rough and uneven. And just like the face of the earth itself is everywhere full of vast protuberances, deep chasms and sinuosities. Galileo's celestial discoveries uh, rekindled the ancient question of the habitability of the moon and the possible plurality of worlds. Were there creatures uh, to be found in those protuberances, chasms, and sinuosities? And if so, what were they like? So these questions proved the fertile soil for uh, poets who sent their fictional rovers to planets and other celestial bodies. Poems inspired by the telescopic discoveries persisted all the way into the mid 18th century. In mid 17th century, they had been joined by witty poems on complementary discoveries, those of the microscope. This different optic tube uh, opened the subvisible worlds to the human eye. 
Now, unfortunately, this corpus of poems on both telescopic and microscopic uh, progress has gone largely under the critical radar. The reason for this uh, could be the fact that a great deal of it is in Latin, uh, the lingua franca of 17th century science, but not of today. Neo-Latin studies have engaged with the better known examples of such poetry, such as Thomas Gray's 18th century poem on the habitability of the moon. Yet the sheer vastness of Neo-Latin poetry in the period means that much of this material remains untouched. So some of the texts <clears throat> that I will discuss today have never before been translated into English. Written by Englishmen, they deal with topics that were important in the English scientific world, so they should be included in literary accounts of the period. It is easy to forget that these poems are not just Neo-Latin, they are also very Anglo-Latin. Moreover, they are not only interesting and worthy of attention in their own respect, which should be enough, but they can additionally also throw light on the well-known examples of English poetry on similar subjects, enabling refreshing readings of familiar texts. Now, another reason for the relative neglect of poetry dealing with these themes uh, is that a good deal of it was written by university students. Some of the poems, and this includes those written in English, are only found in manuscript, uh, in student notebooks and miscellanies. Telescopic and microscopic topics uh, continue to be popular well into the 18th century, uh, which could be yet another reason for the neglect. Uh, usually, there is a clear boundary between the study of 17th and 18th century poetry. Yet, uh, Cambridge University's Act and Tripos verses give ample evidence for the continuing popularity of these topics. Now, these Act and Tripos verses <clears throat> were distributed at annual graduation ceremonies uh, at Cambridge, while the student in question kept his Act, that is, read his two theses, which he was expected to defend. This student was called Tripos because he sat on a three-legged stool. Uh, and this is where the verses get their name from. The verses were produced on the topics of these set disputations and were generally printed in pairs on broadsheets, as you can see here. Many of the poems engage with philosophical and scientific questions, usually in a lighthearted and witty way. On this 1639 sheet, we thus find a poem entitled Absurdum Esdari Orbem Habitabilem in Luna. It is absurd to propose that there is a habitable world in the moon. Here, Lucina, the Roman goddess of childbirth, is invoked. You are the only one capable of helping the moon. She is giving birth not to a calf, but to a new world. So the moon is here pitied as it is envisioned as being in labor. Uh, she is giving birth to an entire world, which must be very painful. The calf uh, refers to a moon calf, a monstrous birth, which was thought to be the product of the sinister influence of the moon. So the poem invokes the associations of the moon with terrestrial events. And it ends with a pithy warning. Give the earthly to the earth and the heavenly to the heavens. The one who mixes heavens with the earth negates both. The verses mirror Jesus' answer to the Pharisees in Mark, render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. Uh, the poem is a reaction to the heated contemporary topic of the plurality of worlds. Already in 1550, uh, the Danish Lutheran scholar Philip Melanchthon uh, opposed this thesis on religious grounds, uh, saying that Jesus died only for us. When it comes to Galileo himself, he neither supported nor defended the possibility of extraterrestrial life. Uh, but just a year before this Cambridge poem was written, uh, that is in 1638, nine, uh, it depends, 38, 39, Reverend John Wilkins uh, published his The Discovery of a World in the Moon, or a discourse tending to prove that it's probable there may be another habitable world in that planet. Uh, the same year, uh, 1638 saw the publication of Bishop Francis Godwin's fictional lunar voyage, The Man in the Moon. Opinions fluctuated throughout the 17th century. Uh, in 1651, the Jesuit astronomer Giovanni Battista Riccioli uh, prefaced his map of the moon with the uncompromising statements that nec homines lunam incolum, nec anime in lunam uh, migrant. Uh, 
which means uh, humans do not inhabit the moon, souls do not migrate to the moon. So here, Riccioli is explicitly negating the possibility that the moon is inhabited in either a literal or a more metaphysical way. So neither men nor their souls dwell there. There is a similar variety of views expressed in the poetry of the period. A satiric and witty view is espoused in, in a much later 1723 poem, uh, which belongs to a collection uh, entitled Carmina Quadragesimalia, which was composed by Oxford students and recited appropriately in the School of Natural Philosophy. The poem's title is in the typical form of a disputation question, An luna habitabilis, is the moon habitable? Uh, with the answer, no. When Hevelius drew the plains of the moon in his map and the river that winds through the mountains, he divided the delineated world among the astronomers. These regions you hold, Kepler, those you, Galileo. Copernicus claims yonder fields and lofty peaks. Tycho holds that grove in the middle of the orb. What use are these estates to their masters? If they wanted to sell a thousand acres of that land, who will be the buyer? Now, this is an interesting example of how contemporary poetry molds the empirical facts to fit its own interests. Hevelius did indeed draw a detailed map of the moon. However, uh, the names he gave uh, to lunar features were drawn from the geography of the Earth. Uh, thus, we have Mare Adriaticum, uh, Mon Sinai, and Palestina. But Kepler, Galileo, uh, Copernicus, and Tycho, referred to in the poem, actually feature, feature in another lunar map, uh, that by the already mentioned Richon. He named four craters after them, as you can see here. Uh, we have Galileo, Kepler, Copernicus, and Tycho. And these names have actually been retained in modern moon mapping. Riccioli would not fit into this hexameter verse. So it was poetically more convenient to replace him with Hevelius, where elision makes it possible to fit it in with the rest, as we can see when we scan the line. Cum tabule velius lunae de pink seratagros. In this playful and form conscious way, uh, poetry creates a new reality, fruitfully fusing fact and fiction. Where Riccioli has four craters, the poem paints more vivid geographical features, uh, comprising fields, lofty peaks, and even a grove. So a concrete physical space uh, forms in the mind of the reader. And the terrestrial is further emphasized in the choice of words praedia, yugera, and fundum. Um, that is estates, uh, acres, and land with their unmistakably earthly flavor. With these comes the twist at the end of the poem, whereas lands on earth have monetary value, those on the moon are useless and unsellable. Other poems chose a different approach when responding to empirical evidence. A constant presence in the Western poetic imagination since antiquity, uh, the moon's traditional literary role could now be cheekily challenged, as it was in the poem entitled Luna is Habitabilis, The Moon is uh, Inhabited by a Cambridge student. Does that huge globe move through the great emptiness so that it could, night wandering, extend golden light to a thief? or so that it could watchful guide the lover's footsteps when he stands freezing before the bolt of an unrelenting mistress, singing praise and mournful songs. So the poem uh, executed in dignified dactylic hexameters plays with the tradition of the Roman love elegy, uh, using the customary motif of the exclusus amator, a locked out lover uh, who is engaging in a paraclausitheron, a lament beside the door. So the verses reject the notion that the moon's only role is to shine light on human affairs, be they thieving or amorous. Not with this purpose does the moon revolve. Doubtless she has her own nations, plants, beasts. She has illustrious cities and rugged rocks, mountains as high as heavens and a deep sea. So the moon's traditionally smooth surface is transformed into a rugged and varied landscape with immense possibilities. As we have seen, contemporary moon maps are miles away from the image of a moon as a golden night wandering lamp, a smooth and empty space. So the, moon, the poem uh, accordingly moves on to contemplate the possible characteristics of the moon's peoples and its weather. 
But in what bodily form and in what multitudes the selenites move, or what color their fields are? If the soil is bedewed by rain, or if hail rushes down through the air, or if lightning fires fall down from discharged clouds? Whether the Lunarian Suevi go to horrid wars, or a Turk fills the fields with a huge army. What was once a smooth and polished sphere, part of Ptolemy's mathematical universe, and the symbol of purity in the poetic tradition has become a very realistic landscape uh, subject to weather and containing its own population. Uh, as on earth, uh, the people are imagined to be divided into nations that are sometimes at war one with another. And the poem uses relatable examples, the Swabi and the Turks. Um, and this is in the, here it is in line with the tendency of poetry on scientific matters in the period uh, to resort to familiar figures and concepts in the attempt to explain the unfamiliar. In the case of poetry influenced by telescopic discoveries, uh, the significance of the terrestrial uh, proves paramount. And it affirms uh, Scott Montgomery's creative conclusion that Copernicus, as he says, in some sense was wrong after all. The earth has never ceased being the center of the universe. Indeed, both the lunar maps and poems on the moon's habitability uh, testify to the continuing centrality of earth. Uh, the moon was not the only ethereal scene transformed by telescope inspired poems. Taking that cue from Bernard de Fontenelle's uh, conversation on the plurality of worlds, uh, there are several extant poems entitled Planetae sunt habitabiles, the planets are habitable. And one uh, by Jacob Bryant, a freshman at King's, uh, starts off by imagining the moon's inhabitant as a gibbosus homunculus, a humped homunculus, uh, which is a sort of a lunar hobbit who frequently gets drunk on wine. When Brian comes to the description of Saturn, uh, he says that being far away from the sun, no spring ever gladdens the fields, nor summer's charms, but harsh winter and terrible cold on all sides cannot be softened by the distant sun. The description uh, follows closely the sinister depiction of the Alps in the third book of Silius Italicus's epic, uh, The Punico. There is no spring anywhere and no beauty of summer, Unsightly winter alone inhabits the gruesome heights and dwells forever there. So we have here Silius Italicus gone into galactic. Uh, the classical and the contemporary come together, uh, not just in their sharing of common themes, but also in the language itself. Um, as you can notice, we have nullum ver unquam, nullum ver usquam, um, aestatis honores, tristis hiems, and then deformis hiems. Saturn, a distant planet, is made less unfamiliar through its implicit visualizing uh, as the earthly elks. Unlike Saturn, Brian's Mercury enjoys the eternal summer because of its proximity to the sun. Termed Felix Senibus Sedes, the happy seat of the elderly, uh, it is a celestial Brighton or Florida where the senior population seems to thrive. The chilly frenzy of illness is banished from its shores, and genial heat continually nourishes the exhausted limbs. The savage port and fever does not shake the people there, nor does panting cough tire old women or strike out teeth from the old mouth. The passage envisions a parallel reality, where a troop of diseases does not around, dance around the elderly as it does in juveniles' tense satire. So here, quote and fever does not even exist. Uh, again, a specific disease is named in order to familiarize the unfamiliar setting. Uh, here, uh, the Mercurian pensioners are nourished by the sun's rays and live free from the accustomed cough or loss of teeth. Another very visual description in Brian's poem is that of Titan, Saturn's largest moon. He says, perhaps those places and those parched lands are inhabited too, and the natives, their limbs bedewed with salamander water, enjoy the heaven's central radiance. By the time that this poem was written, uh, salamander's supposed incombustibility, inherited from classical times, uh, had been refuted by natural philosophers. So Bryant uh, seems to use the salamander in a fantastic fashion, rather than as empirical evidence interweaving science and tradition once again. Like Bryant, Christopher Smart traces the territories and conditions of other planets in the Milky Way and populates them with different races. 
uh, Smart wrote his Tripos verse in 1741 and entitled it entitled them Datur Mundorum Pluralitas, There Are Many Worlds. And here he writes his frisky Pegasus, uh, skipping from one planet to the next. Venus, for example, is transformed into a pastoral space, where in Francis Fox's translation, soft breeds the air, fair flora paints the ground, and fruitful Ceres deals her gifts around. This blissful tempi no rough blasts molest of blustering boreas or the baleful east, but gentle zephyrs or the woodland stray court the tall trees and round the branches play. The well-known uh, fair nymphs and amorous swains, uh, as Smart says, populate this mild Arcadian landscape where all, all is love, as Smart would have it. All verses here have uh, but one, have a classical reference uh, in this construction of Venus's pastoral landscape. Uh, we have goddesses flora and Ceres, uh, location, the Vale of Tempe, and the winds, Boreas and Zephyrs. Saturn, on the other hand, is an antithesis of pastoral scenery. No flocks, no herds here feed in, in spacious wide, no fountains musically murmuring glide. Then genial waste, no tender herbage yields, no harvests wave luxuriant in the fields. The woods, if woods there be, lie leafless low beneath black mountains of eternal snow. Dull animals inhabit this abode, the owl, mole, dormouse, tortoise, and the toad. Dull rivers roll within their channels deep, and only feed the poppy as they creep, whose stagnant fumes and dozing draughts invite perpetual slumbers in perpetual night. So the landscape and its inhabitants are defined via a negation of a familiar pastoral setting. Uh, in this way, the passage conjures two different landscapes at once. After invoking images of flocks, herds, pastures, uh, musical fountains, herbage, and luxuriant harvests, the barren landscape that follows is incredibly rich. So this is an upside down world where the first four lines are subverted, where leafless woods lie beneath black mountains of eternal snow. Dull animals are its only inhabitants, uh, and its equally dull rivers in the deep channels creep up to feed the poppy, which is a classical symbol of death, um, exhaling stagnant fumes that invite perpetual slumbers in perpetual night. Uh, Satan's landscape is in this way transformed into a slothful panorama uh, resembling a Stygian underworld. So for unfamiliar landscapes of the outer space, uh, were transformed into those familiar from terrestrial geography and classical mythology. Familiariz familiarizing the unfamiliar uh, could also be achieved with the help of contemporary writings and references to objects and concepts that would be familiar to the contemporary English reader. In the most famous English poem on telescopic observations, the Elephant uh, in the Moon, uh, Samuel Butler draws on Kepler's Somnium and his two lunar nations, uh, the Subovani and the Priovani, that is those who live on the side of the moon facing the earth and those who live on the opposite side. Butler transforms the moon into a landscape of mathematically defined cellars, uh, expanded into a network of towns and cities which are influenced by the weather. The inhabitants of the moon, when the sun shines hot at noon, do live in cellars underground of eight miles deep and eighty round, in which at once they fortify against the sun and the enemy, which they count towns and cities there because their people civiler than those rude peasants that are found to live upon the upper ground, called privolvans with whom they are perpetually in open war. The military dimension, uh, seen in the Cambridge poem's suggestion of the Lunarian Suavian Turks, is also indispensable here. When they are not sheltering from the midday sun, the subvolvans engage in war with the privolvans, and the members of the Royal Society observe one such heated fight. The battles desperately fought, the gallant subvolvani rally, and from their trenches make a sally upon the stubborn enemy, who now begin to rout and fly. These silly ranting prevolvans have every summer their campaigns and muster like the warlike sons of rawhead and of bloody bones, as numerous as Solon geese in the islands of the Orcades, courageously to make a stand and face their neighbors hand to hand until the longed for winters come and then return in triumph home. So in his projection of the lunar landscape, 
Butler relies on comparisons with familiar earthly things, trenches, uh, the folklore bogeymen, rawhead and bloody bones, and uh, Solon geese provide concrete English images to his readers, helping them visualize the unknown world in the moon. Such a strategy for familiarizing the unfamiliar is in line with the contemporary use of comparisons with commonplace objects in the writings of natural philosophers, uh, as analyzed by Alexander Ragg Morley. So Butler's poetic text mirrors the ways in which vividness and familiarization uh, was achieved in English natural history observations. Just as the telescope uh, sparked a poetic envisioning of new worlds in the other planets, uh, so the microscope uncovered mundi in mundi sin infinitum, infinite worlds within worlds. As great things became smaller with the aid of the telescope, bringing stars and planets up close, so small things became greater with the aid of the microscope, enlarging insects and plants until they reached unrecognizable shapes. Robert Hooke's stunning illustrations of pests in his uh, 1665 micrographia, including a louse and a mite, uh, changed the perception of these animals. Uh, suddenly these creatures jumped off the pages, detailed and odd and strange. So these new worlds and their hairy inhabitants uh, sparked the imaginations uh, of the poets no less than the imagined landscapes and life on other planets. An English poem uh, to Mr. Moses Brown with the present of a microscope uh, thus invites its addressee to direct his view from the telescope to the microscope. Hence, optic arts have shown the assisted eye new scenes of wonders here, new worlds on high. Ethereal scenes my friend has traversed long, thy nightly haunts and subject of thy song. Then close a while thy astronomic wing, leave Jove's satellites and old Saturn's ring. The gift I send, though small the present seems, shall find thee nearer yet as wondrous things. New species this alert with life expands, numerous as dewdrops or as ocean sands. So the poet wrenches us from Jove's satellites and Saturn's ring to observe uh, new worlds down below. Uh, the author recognizes the complementary relationship between these two realms. Uh, the infinite miniature worlds can be considered a sort of a parallel to the plurality of worlds in cosmological terms. In his 1714 monodology, Leibniz stated that every piece of nature can be comprehended as a garden full of plants and a pond full of fish. But every twig of the plant, every member of the animal, every drop of his juices is in turn such a garden and such a pond. So this idea of the world as an infinite series of worlds, one placed within the other, uh, increasingly smaller than the previous one, becomes expressed in this poem as well. There's scarce a leaf that trembles in the air whose hills and valleys do not millions bear. A single drop of water can embrace 10,000 creatures of aquatic race. So when seen through the microscope, the leaf uh, is a universe in itself as is a drop of water. Uh, the microscope enables uh, the imperfect human eye to perceive new hills, valleys, and seas populated by the smallest of creatures. Contemporary poems recognize uh, that a process of transformation uh, occurs when the human eye uh, approaches the microscope. A 1723 Tripus poem uh, opening with an Ovidian twist thus announces, of wonderful sights I sing, of light things, of a tiny brood and a slight weightless troop of slim limbs and a known form, I turn them into new forms and hardly their own bodies. Familiar animals of slim limbs and known forms are here re-envisioned and refashioned. Uh, they assume new forms and new bodies, hardly their own. Uh, in an English translation of a Latin poem on the microscope, uh, Reverend Sylvester, Sylvester Tipping uh, similarly observes, past nature's limits through the convex row, they wear new limbs and members not their own. So throughout the poems inspired by the microscope, uh, tiny creatures undergo uh, these radical physical transformations, breaking out of their natural limits. And these changes are explained by a reference to an episode uh, from the fourth book of the Metamorphosis. Similarly, if small things can be compared with the great, uh, when Perseus showed the face of snaky haired Medusa to Atlas, in the reflection of Athena's shield, he saw Atlas change and grow into a huge mountain that supported the stars. 
Familiar mythological characters and, uh, and events are employed uh, to explain the transformation of insects into other creatures. There is a clever pun in Si Parva Liket Componer Magnis. The poet asks uh, for permission to compare the tiny world of the microscope with the great world and heroes of classical mythology. But the central topic itself uh, in microscopic poetry is the comparison of the small with the great. So as with the planets, which tend to be described in familiar earthly terms, the insects are likened to familiar animals of larger sizes. In the 1747 Tripos poem, thus the glass shows the net carrying the horns of a huge deer. The net can suddenly be seen as a wholly different species uh, since its horns resemble the majestic antlers of a deer. And even more strikingly, uh, through the lens of the microscope, the noxious moth becomes a strutting peacock. But although you quickly gnaw on my poems with your notorious tooth, I will not omit, omit to mention you, moth, who are similar to a peacock in shape and feathers. Here you can see what the antennae of a male moth uh, look like under a microscope. Uh, its shape and colors are indeed very similar to those adorning uh, a peacock. Uh, the importance of the familiar in approaching novel things is equally clear in a uh, in an earlier 1685 Pindaric poem on three skips, uh, three skips of a louse by the Oxford student Samuel Wesley. Wesley uses uh, the form of the Greek ode uh, to tell of the speaker's visit to the moon in a chariot driven by a louse. So the speaker enters the world of the microcosm where everything seems larger than himself. In relation to him, uh, the tiny insect now seems to be the size of an elephant. So rides the great mogul in state, when at proud Agra's trembling gate, met by each humble as a potentate, with flowers the roads are paved, with flowers the houses crowned, and brutish mirth and barbarous joy runs all along, whilst he uplifted high like a new titan scales the sky. In this bright vignette, we see Akbar the Great, the third mogul emperor, riding majestically on an elephant. Uh, Troki slowed down the pace to mimic the solemn marching of the animal. And Akbar reaches the scale of a titan as he looms above his subjects who have decorated the roads and houses with flowers. Uh, the, the paradoxical juxtaposition of flowers and a louse, uh, an animal associated with filthiness, serves Wesley's mock heroic purpose. Uh, at the end of the poem, the image of the elephant reappears. Yet my undaunted louse can scorn them all. He rears his strong proboscis high and does the unmanly rage defy of each unequal enemy and like himself intends to fall. His martial soul peeps through his alabaster skin. The bloody drop moves quick and beats a point of war within. The heroic louse scorns its enemies and like uh, one of Akbar's war elephants, rears his proboscis high. Wesley is alluding to contemporary scientific writings as the word proboscis is frequently used in Hooke's descriptions of insects. Uh, the louse's warrior soul peeps through its white skin, uh, for which Wesley offers the following prose remark. No creature in the world so testy as a louse. In a microscope, one drop of blood is seen passing up and down very nimbly in the nature of a pulse." End of quote. So this note is in agreement with Hooke's observation that the creature is so transparent that he could plainly discern a small current of blood passing directly from its snout into its belly. Uh, thus the contemporary writings inform Wesley's verse uh, just as they inform the poetry about the planets. So as the net becomes a deer with huge antlers, a moth, a peacock with shiny feathers, and a louse, a war elephant, different new scenarios and new ways of viewing the world become possible. Uh, the already mentioned Reverend Tipping uh, indulges in recounting a tragic death of a mite. A needle there the tortured mite impales, though armed its sides and fenced with double males. O oh, ghastly sight, what strife, what pains molest, what raging fury swells its little breast. Gnashing its teeth, it reads itself around, the raving boar so takes the fatal wound, rolls on the spear, and foaming tears the ground. Thrice he essays to bite the pointed lance, and thrice in vain his troops of thighs advance. The rigid steel his fixed sides detains and renders frustrate all his grasping pains. 
So the mite has armed sides and, and double males. So its tiny body is equip equipped like that of an epic hero. After being pierced by the needle, uh, its little breast swells, it gnashes its teeth and contorts its toe. Not only is the mite likened to a boar foaming and rolling on the spear, but there is also an echo of the fight between Cadmus and the dragon from the third book of Ovid's Metamorphosis. Uh, after sending his companions to a grove uh, to bring sacrificial water, Cadmus finds them slain by a ferocious dragon, and the battle between the two ensues. Uh, with a full length of iron buried in the serpent's side, in agony, it twisted back its head to see the wound and bit the deep sunk shot. And straining it from side to side, at last wrenched it away, but still the iron stuck fast. Now to its natural rage, new source of rage was added. In its throat, the arteries swelled huge. Its poison fangs were flecked with foam. Like the dragon, the mite rages, uh, twists in agony, and bites the deadly lance. Again, the poetic procedure relies on using familiar examples, uh, in this case, a familiar animal, the boar, and then the classics, uh, to explain new scenes of wonder revealed by the microscope. The death of the mite is simultaneously poignant and humorous. Uh, see how cold death dissolves his jointed knees, his slender claws, what shaking tremor sees. At length he faints, with head and neck reclined, and dying calls his dainty selves to mind. So here the mite has decidedly become a he rather than it, uh, which bestows personality and dignity onto it, or rather him. Uh, the act of fainting is especially amusing as his head and neck are reclined, uh, a description that would usually be used of either a larger animal or a human, and certainly not an insect that looks like this. Uh, so most of the poems, inspired by the microscope, zoom in on their subjects and try to explain what the human eye can see through the microscopic lens. When they engage with the classics, uh, these poems most often rely on Ovid's uh, metamorphosis. Uh, this work, together with uh, examples of familiar larger animals, uh, enables the poets to explain to their readers the strange new look of the suddenly unfamiliar insects. Uh, the theme of transformation also allows these poems uh, to create new heroes, or sometimes mock epic heroes, out of unlikely subjects. As we have seen both categories of poems, uh, those inspired by the stargazing trunk and those inspired by the microscopic glass, share the desire and the attempt to familiarize the unfamiliar. As the poets jump from one planet to the next in our solar system, they take with them classical mythology and terrestrial geography. Uh, there are alpine summits on Saturn, uh, pastoral landscapes on Venus, and even villages of retired people on Mercury. If there are any animals, uh, they are the familiar salamander, owl, mole, dormouse, tortoise, and a toad. Likewise, the strange new sights revealed by the microscope are likened to familiar creatures of larger sizes, deer, peacocks, uh, elephants, boars, and dragons. So this corpus of poems uh, shows the continuity of the same topics from the 17th well into the 18th century, uh, and its richness in the interweaving of the classical with contemporary uh, advances in science makes it an area worth studying. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.